the, uh, my, our second speaker of the event here today is Imam Muhammad al-Asi, uh, who will be addressing uh, colonialism in the Islamic world, focusing on the Saudi takeover of the Arabian Peninsula under the watch of the British East India okay. Trading Company and uh, how it's evolved until today. Uh, Imam Asi is a deeply learned man and scholar who has studied the Arabic language in Lebanon before graduating with a degree in government and politics from the University of Maryland. Imam Asi was a former prayer leader at the Islamic Center of Washington and has been an outspoken critic of the Saudi establishment. Uh, and Imam Asi has traveled the world and educated people from various communities worldwide. We are absolutely honored and uh, privileged to have him here today. Again, please, uh, we a warm welcome to Imam Asi with a round of applause, please. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of the mercy giver the most merciful I greet you with the greetings of peace assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah um, I have a long list of um, I guess grievances I could uh, begin to express concerning the injustice that has been, that is now taking a more obvious course, whether it is concerning the British government or whether it's con concerning the Saudi Arabian government or whether it's concerning the Israeli government or whether it's concerning the American government in no particular order. Uh, but obviously I have to stick with the subject matter. The subject matter is, and for your information, uh, Sister Catherine was not allowed to come to the United States for some type of maybe uh, expressed technicality, whatever the details are, we don't know, at least I don't know. But yours truly is not permitted to go to Britain. I wish we could get rid of that word Great Britain. Just drop the word great and say Britain. So uh, yours truly here can't go to Britain. I can't go to Saudi Arabia to perform my religious duty over there. And I don't know what's going to be in the future. And all of this has to do just attempting to speak truth to power. That's the whole issue. Uh, the British, they have a history, a worldwide history, actually, of colonialism. Um, they were colonialists here in the Americas. They were colonialists in uh, Asia, in Africa, in um, you name it. They're all over the place, colonialists. So you have to grant it to them. They have experience. That experience is not what we would like as decent human beings, but they have accumulated a lot of experience. And one field that they have excelled in is the field of dividing. They are experts at division. Divide and conquer, divide and rule. They know how to play that pretty well. Uh, they colonized uh, India and they were thinking at one time of dividing India into something called uh, Hindustan, something else called Pakistan, and yet something else which did not see the light of day, which was called Princistan. That was supposed to be the areas in, uh, in India that were too loyal to the British, so they had to have enclaves of their own. Uh, what we are concerned with is the presence of the British in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, we have today, uh, the world has a serious problem. Uh, and that problem is manifested in our time frame now, in the past years, in our current um, uh, time. We have these, um, some people call them ISIS, some people call them Daesh, some people call them other names. 
But the fact of the matter, they are a contingent of people from all around the world. The Saudi money uh, with its uh, British and American and European shells, that Saudi money goes all the way, everywhere in the world. And it establishes madrasas. These are like religious Islamic schools. It uh, buys virtually Islamic centers in different parts of the world. Included in that is here in the United States. Plenty of them have a money trail that you can uh, trace all the way back to Riyadh and Jidda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so these uh, murderers and these terrorists have nothing to do with Islam. Uh, unfortunately, we have, uh, I want to sound like uh, the president, we have a media that is not telling the truth. But we do have a media that also knows how to spin things. It knows how to dislocate the facts. And one of these areas that the media has not covered honestly and with transparency has to do with these, uh, they're called tekfiris. And that's a word uh, coming from uh, Islamic vocabulary that basically means we believe in the superiority of ourselves as Wahhabis and whoever agrees with us and the inferiority of everyone else. Now this is not, this attitude is not located specifically in Islam. It just has a violent expression nowadays by those who have Islamic families or Islamic heritage or Islamic culture or whatever. And what gives them a punch, what makes them have a punch, is the fact that they have money. And uh, so all of this began way back in the 18th century. I mean, it has details here and there. But to make a long story short, this whole issue of Wahhabism emanated in the Arabian Peninsula in the 18th century. The founder of that aberration, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, was born in the first decade of the 18th century, and he died in the last decade of the 18th century. And between those two decades, he was roaming the Arabian Peninsula, basically, uh, killing, first of all, accusing those who don't agree with his understanding <clears throat> of Islam, it, accusing them of being kafirs. Kafirs is, kafir is a word that is not translated accurately. Some orientalists and some politicians and some people in the media, they translated as infidel or disbeliever or heathen. All of these words have no equivalents in Islamic terminology. In Islamic vocabulary, there's no equivalent for that. But the attitude, I'm trying to give you a sense of how these killers and these uh, dislocated individuals, how they think, and I'm being generous to say that they think, they have no thoughts, it's just notions that they have. Because that whole, let me call it sect, I also try to avoid the word sect, but in this case I think it's appropriate. This type of sect considers anyone who does not agree with them to be an enemy and an enemy of God. And from there they take it, they give themselves the license to kill. They've been doing this and they've corrupted two Islamic words. One of them is kufr. The word takfir that I just mentioned is taken from that. And that simply means denying God his divinity and his authority. Doesn't, it doesn't mean heathen or it doesn't mean unbeliever and all of these other things. They've corrupted the meanings of these two words and they've took that corruption and worked it out into raw hatred. They promote hatred. 
And even though I'm saying this, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the internal Islamic self in the world. Uh, they have common denominators with others. And I'll, I'll leave that to your common sense. So they promote animosity. Uh, you've seen some of these uh, terrible uh, pictures of them uh, killing uh, innocent individuals, execution style, beheadings, chewing on human organs, crucifying individuals, throwing others from high-rise buildings to their death, and all of this other stuff that has no basis whatsoever in the faith of Islam. And I'm willing, uh, I wish they would come, you see, because they don't think, and they promote ignorance. They don't promote thinking. They're against philosophy, they're against the arts, they're against uh, intellectual life, they're against all of that. Their grand mufti says, uh, this mufti died, but when he was alive, he said that the, uh, that the earth is not spherical. The earth is not round. The earth is flat. That's, that's the highest religious authority in that land. And it's, that one, of the, one of their princes, Prince Sultan or whatever his name was, he, he was an astronaut. He went up and he took a look. He saw the earth as a sphere. He came back to his religious authority, that mufti, and he said, but look, uh, your, high, your eminency, I saw the earth, it was wrong. He said, no, that's, uh, that, uh, they're playing tricks on you. Don't believe what you saw. And uh, this is how it goes. So anyways, in, in, the 18th, in the 18th century, there was an alliance between two tribes in, under the supervision of the British. That alliance was between the family of Saud, the current rulers, the whole country is called, is named, the title of it has their name. And the other family was the family of a shaykh. This is Ibn Abdul Wahhab, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab's family. These two clans got together in the Arabian Peninsula and forged this type of what you may call power center. These are just nomads on the Arab in the Arabian desert, that's all. But it was the British at the time that were playing them off once against the Ottomans. There was a grand game in the world. The Ottomans were there, the Russians were there, the, the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire was there, the, et cetera, et cetera. So to, to try to, to work out termite policies inside the Muslim body politic, the British sponsored these two families and in sponsoring them they had them they had them go to war with others there were bloody wars on the level of nomads of course where there was no weapons of sophistication at that time but they played them out against each other and the final result was that these were the winners the the family of saud and the family of a sheikh the political marrying the religious, so to speak, and they put together that kingdom. Um, they're known to have massacred Muslims who want to perform their pilgrimage, simply going to Mecca once in a lifetime, whenever it is possible. They, they are known to have gone there and massacred those who, dis, who disagree with them. Uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab has a brother, his name is Sulaiman ibn Abdul Wahhab, who wrote a book exposing the fallacies of his own brother. Uh, the, the king of that land, the 1930s, stole three regions belonging to Yemen, which currently are, if you take a map, the south western corner of Saudi Arabia. That, that region there belongs to Yemen, doesn't belong to them. But anyways, they stole it because they had British, uh, the British and the colonialists covering up for them. They have their petty dif differences there, but it's all under the surface right now. Uh, they've, they've proven themselves in the past 
in the past century, uh, the Saudis have proven themselves to be against the Arabs as a people coming together. They were in a virtual uh, cold and then it turned into a hot war in Yemen. Back in the 1960s, there was a war in Yemen. And in that war, around 200,000 people were killed. Yemen turned out to be the Vietnam of the Egyptians because of the instrumentality of the Saudi regime in that episode. And then there was the war on the Palestinians that culminated in Black September. Uh, I, I'm sure you know some of those details. And today you have the Saudi Arabian war against uh, Islamic Iran, and that is taking place in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Bahrain, and in other areas. Uh, uh, Hayim Wiseman, uh, before the establishment of the... Um, uh, artificial state of Israel, uh, went to, uh, to two uh, rulers, the ruler, the king in Arabia, the Saudi king, and said, we want you to accept our presence in, uh, in Palestine. And he said something like, to the effect that whatever the British agree to, we agree to, and we consider these our cousins and they have a right to be there. Compare that or contrast it with Sultan Abdul Hamid, who was the ruler in Istanbul, what was left of the Ottoman state. He said, it's easier for you to, dis to dismember a part of my body than to take away a part of, of the land on which I have authority. I think I'm running out of time. I, I see uh, the moderator. There's so many other things I wanted to say. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you for coming and making an effort. I think there's going to be a question and answer session. During that, I think we can get down to the nitty gritty of it. Thanks again and peace again. Thank you very much, Imam Mohammed Al Asi. Uh, yes, of course, there will be a Q&A session coming up right at the end, so we will have an opportunity for everyone in the audience to throw some questions at, uh, at the Imam as well. Uh, we have to move on due to our tight schedule. We 